Go, Encadio, 212. Comp check. DPS. Go. Inco. Go. PUS. Go. Surgeon. Go. Booster. Go. Copy that. We have a go from you guys. This is talking sound. The audio and video you are seeing right now. The amazing Jimmy Blue. Stepping into the world of the tribute musician with the amazing Jimmy Blue and the Voodoo Child Review. You know, I spent years as an in-house audio engineer and cover bands were always some of my favorites, but more than anything, tribute bands. Bands that specifically focused around an artist. I worked with a great Prince tribute band for a long time, worked with a couple of Grateful Dead tribute bands. Uh, this is specifically a Jimi Hendrix tribute band, which in and of itself is some of the hardest technique, uh, even in, and really it's the style, it's the, it's the sound, it's everything that is so entirely hard to mimic and get right. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight, folks, is that precision of musicianship that it takes. It's totally different than your standard band that's playing some cover tunes in a bar on a Friday night. So when we get back from this message from our sponsors, we will be talking to the amazing Jimmy right after this. Have you considered starting a podcast? Looking for a way to make your business a voice of authority in an industry? Then Podcast Cadet is the solution for you. Whether starting a podcast for yourself, your brand, business, school, church, or just plain fun, Podcast Cadet is here to help you navigate the waters of the podcast industry. Specializing in one-on-one -on -one consultation and training with industry professionals in fields ranging from podcast technology and editing to distribution, monetization, and even social media strategies, Podcast Cadet tailors their services to the specific needs of you and your podcast. Do you already have a podcast and trying to find ways to engage and grow your audience? Sign up for your Podcast Cadet audit today and let us help you explore new and exciting ways to leverage your content and elevate your podcast brand to whole new levels. From consultation and workshops to affordable podcast production and maintenance packages, Podcast Cadet is your one-stop shop for everything podcast related on the internet. Visit podcastcadet.com today to sign up for your consultation or training and use code TALKING20 to save 20% off your entire purchase. That website again is podcastcadet.com. That's right, folks. Stop on by Podcast Cadet today. They are your source for anything podcast related. You want anything Jimi Hendrix related? Our guest today is the man to talk to. Welcome to the show. How are you today, Jimmy? Hey there, Chris. Thanks for having me here. Appreciate it. I am, I, you know, I am more than happy to have you here. I have been waiting for this interview since our good friend Mark Eddy introduced us. Shout out to you, buddy. Uh, thank you for all the great yeah, people that you have connected me with over the last almost year now. Um, it's been amazing. So, uh, you are one of the many that he has brought me. And like I said, I have spent the day kind of deep diving through your videos. And as somebody who spent almost 20 years as a live audio engineer, man, I am here to tell you, um, you, you got it. Um, I mean, I'm sure you already know that you've been doing this for a hot lick now, but, uh, you got it, man. Um, top to toe, front to back. Um, it's hard, like I said in the intro, for somebody to absolutely nail a performance as somebody else. It's very hard. Um, it's hard enough to do that quote as an impersonator, like a celebrity impersonator, walking around a room, talking to people. 
doing whatnot, much less to actively play guitar as well, to actively sing as well. Um, mind blowing, Jimmy. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, Chris. Well, let's get into it real quick and uh, kind of tweak the knobs a little bit on your history. Uh, let's start. How did you get into the world of music to begin with? Was this a family endeavor? Was it something um, that mom and dad did? Uh, uncle brought you, bought you a drum set one day. How did you get into the world of music to begin with? Uh, yeah, it's a family thing, as you could say. Uh, my grandfather, uh, from my grandfather, my mother, my father, uh, all professional musicians. And, and uh, so I, I guess I had no choice in the matter, you know what I mean, coming up, being raised in a musical uh, environment. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I as well was surrounded by music, so it was something that whenever I went to follow that road in my life uh artistically it was encouraged like 100 percent. it was like oh wow chris is making music um but what's funny jimmy is um work-wise it really wasn't uh was it that way for you like were you were you artistically encouraged but kind of discouraged from following it as a means of making a living, a means of, you know, plying your trade and making an income, so to speak? Well, at first, but then uh, once, uh, especially my mother, I'm a mama's boy, so once mm. she found out that I really wanted to do this, uh, she groomed me to apply for music school. So I went to music school, I went to music college, and yeah, but like I said, then after that, it's if you have no choice, you better make this work because you can't go back and say, okay, I made a mistake. Let me try something else. Doesn't work like that. Yeah. Yeah. No, and and, for me. You know? uh, well, and, and that's just it. You know, it's one of those, you either make it or you break it. Um, right. And for me, I guess it was a, kind of the same journey. I went to school for something totally different than what I do now. I went to school for ministry years ago. Um, so it is literally like 180 degrees from being a full-time audio video engineer. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, for me, it was the once I found the wires, I'd always been into playing with wires as a kid. Once I found my world in the the engineering, the the toys, the knobs, the 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 faders. Um, I was I was engrossed a hundred percent. What was it that brought you into the world of playing guitar? Uh, actually, I went to the High School of Performing Arts in Manhattan from the movie Fame, mm -hmm. and uh, I got in playing trumpet and trombone. And then once I got into Hendrix in my uh, beginning of the junior year, I switched my major to guitar. Oh wow! And uh, had to, you know, had to take the test again, but uh, uh, switched to guitar and focused on that. You know, so that's how I got into really guitar playing. Wow, wow! So uh, yeah, it was something that you just kind of came upon in life. It's not like you uh, were surrounded by guitar your entire life, anything like that. Um, yeah, actually, my uncles—they all played. I I noodled around with it, but it wasn't my main. Mm. You know, I, you know, I could do like little blues licks here and there. I used to, um, my uncle used to, when they came over to visit, sit down and drink and whatever. He would leave his guitar at the house, you know, mm. and I would like play it and mess around with. It. But I went into it because um, at that time in uh, middle school, like back then it was called junior high school. I was doing a James Brown tribute with a very popular local band, and that local band was opening for Cool and the Gang. Uh, we did open for the Ohio players. We were kids, you know. Uh, wow. But I was doing James Brown, you know, and that's that's where I thought I was going as a singer, you know. That's uh, that's really interesting. And what was it about guitar when you because you said that you played trombone before that? Uh, and of course we're going to the high school of performing arts, but uh, what was it about when you found guitar that I guess resonated with you and pulled you down that 
now lifelong rabbit hole. Well, uh, there was a there was a girl who came to school <clears throat> when I was in performing arts, and she had I was trying to get close to her, and she basically had came to school one day with this big button. I think it was an orange button that says the official Jimi Hendrix fan club Warner reprise records. And she was a groupie. She used to get in free to concerts whenever bands like Led Zeppelin, Yes, Grand Funk, whenever they come to town, she, she was a groupie. So she'd get in free. So I guess she was doing that with Hendrix. So I said, well, I figured if I, you know, join the fan club, I'd get close to her. It never happened, but it, uh, I started to get more into Hendrix because at first I, I didn't think I was more into soul being a James Brown tribute person. I wasn't into mm. rock. Yeah. You know, I had seen Sly uh, one time and, you know, just went right by me. But I was, really wasn't into rock. And to me, Jimi Hendrix was black, so he wasn't rock at sure. first. This is my thinking back then, you know what I mean? Mm. I was more into, once I got into rock, I was more into Clapton, Beck, Mark Farner from Grand Funk, sure. Steve Howe. These guys were my heroes, uh, you know. I wanted the long hair and the whole thing. Uh, but uh, what happened is we used to go and to this guy's house and kind of like, uh, how can you say, like smoke? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. But we, you know, we used to go partake. there and hang out. That was our partake. hangout after school. <laughs> yeah, partake. And, and uh, so actually his uh, his uh, father or his uncle came and caught us one time. And we're thinking, okay, this is the end. And he took us in his editing room. And he was a film editor. And he's actually the guy who's responsible, one of the cameramen who did the camera work for Monterey Pop Festival. Oh, wow. And he was showing us raw footage, unedited clips of Monterey. So I'm sitting there waiting for Otis Redding because I'm a singer. I'm like, totally like, oh, man, I can't wait to see Otis. He kept building it up to, oh, wait till you see Otis. He turns this show out. So finally, Jimmy came on. And I was like, I had never seen anybody hold the guitar like that. Mm. You know, other than just playing it. But just the way he held it and moved with it. Never seen that. That's what got me the body movement and the way the sounds was coming out the guitar when he moved his body. And yeah. that stuck with, that sticks with me to this day because nobody plays guitar like that today. Yep. Now there are great guitar players. Uh, matter of fact, a lot of them back then could even play rings around Jimmy. Uh, and he, he had himself admitted that. But the, the, the coolness, the swag, I haven't seen it today. Yeah. No, I, I, yeah, so that's what drew me in, you know. I mean, quite honestly, probably the closest um, modern day equivalent might be the late great Stevie Ray Vaughan. Might be, as far as stage presence in that way. Him, him, and Prince, um, they have they have that I guess same kind of swagger on stage, uh, where it, it it's literally like the world is moving around them while they're playing. Um, it's a totally different style of presence, totally different style of playing to begin with. And the sound that Jimmy had was something that was, I mean, people were using fuzz, distortion, uh, even wah pedals, all kinds of stuff, but um, nothing sounded like that. And, no, and, it, was, it, it was like from another planet. Totally. Yeah. Oh, oh, quite literally. And uh, he was such a transcendental player. He was one of those that when he played, he was, he was, it was like he was not physically there. Yeah. It was like he was somewhere else, um, in his, in his own world and everything came through him. He was such a conduit, uh, for the muse. And what is it like for you? Uh, whenever you play, whenever whenever you get into process, so to speak, is it is it a is it like a slow turn of a dial for you during the day before you have a show to get into the mode of Jimi Hendrix and get get into that place to to literally be able to channel that? 
and that same emotion and visceral feeling in the way that you play and hold and utilize the guitar. What What's your process for that? Uh, my process is I'm an actor. I'm, I'm playing on cello. <laughs> okay. uh, you know what I mean? I get into character. Yeah. I go in the closet, pull the stuff out, get in the character, and then when I finish, come off stage, put it back in the closet. It's, it's as simple as that. I'm, I'm an actor doing a role, and it just so happens that nobody has done Jimmy. Mm. So it's important for people to see the way he reinvented the way that the guitar is approached. That's number one. Yeah. Uh, that made even progressive and very technical guitar players respect this guy. I mean, yeah. you know, when they first they saw him, they said, oh, this guy's a joke. Get out of here. Plus, he's pop. You know, they think, oh, he's pop. Oh, get out of here. But then once they heard, especially listening to the first three albums, mm. and, they, you know, there's nobody playing guitar, like I said, like that today. Listen to the first three albums. There's nobody doing that today. Yeah. Even the people you mentioned, nope. uh, their, their albums, uh, their first, especially the first album, nowhere near yeah. what happened uh, with Jimmy's first album. And uh, so folks need to see that. Uh, folks need to hear that. Plus, folks need to see how the guy did it without any gimmicks, whatever, uh, in your face manner. And that's why uh the tribute show Kiss the Sky is very important. Well uh, it's it's very important. It is. It's hugely important because it really does encapsulate and capture moments in history and moments in time. Like you said, you as an actor, uh you're you're actively studying the footage of Monterey Pop. Uh, you're trying to do the same body movements during the same movements of the song. Um, things like that. And that, that's the beautiful thing about a proper tribute band is that it, it takes that time. It takes that time to craft the image, the sound, the feel of what was going on. And you guys with Kiss the Sky have definitely, definitely done the footage and the feeling of Jimi Hendrix more than justice. Uh, that is that is all that I can say. How long have you guys been at this together as the three of y'all right now? The, the three of us? What, what, what do you mean the three of us? Well, I mean the, the band Kiss the Sky, the, the tribute band itself. Okay, well, Kiss the Sky is not just the three of us, it's a Broadway play type production oh. where we present the experience uh, with two white guys who come out and play Nolan Mitch. Then there's a video and we come out as the band of gypsies with two black guys as Buddy Miles and Billy Cox. And sometimes at festivals, we come out with Jimmy had the five feet span at Woodstock. Uh, with uh, the members who look exactly like the people who uh, that Jimmy played with at Woodstock. Matter of fact, I uh, my blood brother Juma Sultan is uh, one of Jimmy's sidemen at Woodstock, and sometimes he does gigs wow. uh, with me. So I mean, uh, and then we do the cry of love. We usually end it with the cry of love. Jimmy's he had Billy Cox and Mitch Mitchell. All this is a recreation. This is why uh, it's a big mistake to call this and think this is a tribute. This goes way beyond uh, tribute because uh, the main thing is because I was there. I was in Jimmy's fan club. Yep. Uh, Jimmy actually recommended or suggested to me Berkeley College of Music, which, you know, he got on me to take the test at Berkeley, which I did. And uh, so he's responsible for me going there. So I was around him. He didn't quite know my name. Wait, hey, Jimmy Blue, hi. He, he didn't know me like that. I was always with other members of the fan club, but he showed me a few things here and there. So I was there. You know, basically, I've been doing it since 1968. So this is way beyond a tribute because you see, Jimmy himself never had the chance to put all of what I mentioned into one show. He only yeah. was around three, maybe four years. Yeah. And that's what we do. Um, so for the past, uh, since 2016, I've been blessed to come upon the producer of uh, Kiss the Sky, Mike Gotch, who has the same vision that I did. 
of putting together a Broadway type production, not just getting on stage playing Hendrix songs and putting on a wig or a hat. Yeah. But a full production of what this guy did because he was so important. There are other bands who do this. There's uh, Ossie Floyd, who does Pink Floyd. Yeah. Uh, very successful. Uh, uh, we do gigs sometimes with Zoso, who does Led Zeppelin. Yeah. Uh, same thing. These guys do exactly that. So when you do that, you're, you know, you're, uh, you're putting more into what the original artist put into their act. Yeah. When you do that, you know what I mean? Well, well, yeah. And that's what I was saying is that at the beginning is that it, whenever you're doing tributes like this and this kind of stuff, it's, it's a totally different realm. Because you yeah. you have to study every single nuance of everything. You have to know the background behind the stories, if possible. You have to know the background behind the songs to be able to write the fluid story that you're talking about. and The, the narrative that you're trying to get across that is the history of Jimi Hendrix within those four years. Yes. And uh, this thing is so close that... Uh, uh, I've defied cease and desist orders. Oh, wow. Uh, I've def defied bans, uh, you know. Uh, I actually, can imagine. Actually being banned, you know, yeah. being booked somewhere. And then a week later, oh, no, it's so good. You know, because this thing is, I don't want to say so good, but it's so, uh, it, people describe me scary. Mm. You can't, there, there's no words for it when people see it. They try to look for a gimmick. They say, that'll be a catch. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, he's trig and, uh, he's triggering is, tracks or something like that. <laughs> or there's somebody behind the curtain. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, so the thing is, yeah, it's, uh, this is, I'm, I'm just, uh, reiterating what is said to me during the meet and greet. Uh, people, you know, they, they thank me. Most of the people thank me for doing this because it's never been done on Jimmy, but, uh, they're like, yikes. This is very scary. Well, well, like I said, it is. A, I've listened to his work smooth since I was 20, 21 years old uh, in depth. And I am 45. Uh, you're it, to watch you play is a study in Jimi Hendrix style, technique, presence. Um, and once again, even sound, even sound. Uh, how is it that you go about? I mean, I don't want you to give away, like, not that there's any, like, crazy trade tricks. There's tons of columns and blogs out there about how to attain that kind of sound. But um, what exactly are you using live most of the time? What's your go-to uh, whenever you're out and about and, and playing uh, as far as oh, amplifier, well, we things like that? We use what Jimmy used, uh, basically just, you know, updated, of course. Uh, you know, we don't use the same 1968 fuzz pedal, but it is Jimmy's fuzz pedal that he used, you know, uh, with today's, I guess you would say, wiring, whatever. Yeah. But let me tell you something. Jimmy played differently live than he played in the studio. Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to be very honest with you. I saw Jimmy quite often, and most of the time I saw him, he wasn't good. You know, I mean, I'm just being very honest with you. As compared to, like, I saw Chicago a few times. I saw Grand Funk four times. They were excellent all four times. Yes. I saw Yes. Uh, they were always impeccably good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Jimmy, I can't say that well, about, about Hendrix. Well, you know? and granted, Jimmy was also one of those musicians, because I am I'm, I'm a Rush and Pink Floyd are my two. And Rush was... It, it's still to this day, um, probably hands down the most consistent show. And I, I had the pleasure of being on road crew locally with them on a few shows. Uh, I think that they probably throughout my life of seeing and working shows had the most consistent sound as a band and the most consistent playing amongst the musicians. But that's also because they didn't play around. That's the thing about Jimmy, though, is that Jimmy got up there and he he would improv gladly. Yeah, experiment. Um, he yeah, wasn't experiment. he wasn't afraid to literally jump off the edge of the performance and not have no idea where he's going to land. None. Um, yeah, that's a good way of putting it, Chris. And that, that's that, a really good way of putting it. That's hard and that's brave. That is so entirely brave as a musician um 
to because like myself as a musician i do a lot of electronic stuff and i have uh, incorporated a, a bit of improv into my set like i'm always playing to a set backing track but what i'm playing live over it and the effects i'm performing are totally different every time you know mm -hmm. um kind of like the grateful dead where hey yeah we got a three and a half minute of sugar magnolia on an album it may be 10 minutes live um but jimmy went to levels beyond that he he went to like i said levels of straight leaping off the edge of the performance where it's like even the band was like where are you going because this is why mm -hmm. you know um and it's amazing whenever you go back and see some of that footage whenever you go back and hear some of those lost archival recordings of stuff like that it's just mind-blowing improvisation and playing playing hearing somebody literally have fun from the inside of themselves it's it's some of the most beautiful tapestry of sound out there in my opinion um how do you go about even even replicating some of some of that feel um some of that raw raw energy of I guess just taking the performance somewhere else other than just the notes. Well, Jimmy approached uh, rock music like the progressive jazz musicians that he admired. Mm. Uh, Rasa Kirk, uh, he, he loved Coltrane for, for doing exactly what you described. Yeah. Uh, people like that. So he was putting that in a rock vein. That's why he had to have his drummer, Mitch Mitchell, who was a jazz drummer, really. And um, so that's why the whole thing worked a, a lot of times. Yeah. Uh, so, that's, you know, I'm basically doing the same thing. I have my Mitch Mitchell, who's a, a, the same guy studied Mitch. And um, so I approach the music in, in the same way. It's um, the Jimmy, like I said, he played a whole new way of incorporating sounds and body movement, but he also had a unique vocal style. Yeah. And, um, you know, a lot of it went to Dylan, but just the, the way he, he didn't quite sing, you know, and he didn't quite rap. He just, <laughs> the way it just comes out is very unique. So it all worked into one package. And, uh, so that's what we try to do, bring that package in front of people. And for you as somebody, especially as you were saying, um, who was a vocalist to begin with before you even started in with trombone, things like that. Uh, what was it like for you to try to emulate that so unique style of vocal of Jimmy's? Uh, just studying, like uh, I said earlier, as an actor. Uh, but just once I did that, I got into the music. I got into uh, where he was going before he died. Because he, the Jimi Hendrix of Monterey Pop is way different from the Jimi Hendrix before he died. He became spiritually involved. Um, mm. You know, he he involved spiritually and was going in a whole nother direction with the music. But uh, with 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 what I'm doing with Jimmy, nothing this detailed has ever been done or with any performer. Uh, live, I perform the iconic periods of his life. I do lecture demonstrations in person and television about this guy and his music. I can go into the studio and drum, bass, guitar, and vocals myself. Hmm. Okay. Uh, like I said, this hasn't been done with any other artist, And uh, that's because of where this guy was going with the music and what he did for music. And this is what is not studied. Um, Matter of fact, uh, if you go to musical colleges now, uh, some of them may, even, like Berkeley, they, may, they even may have a course in Hendrix, let's say. This isn't brought up, what I just mentioned. That's not brought up. Yeah. Because they don't take his music seriously. You know what I mean? They, they, uh, they think it's, okay, he's a good rock guitar player, a good rock musician, he took a lot of drugs, boom, that's Jimi Hendrix's story. And it's like, so this is very important with, what I'm doing, uh, not just with Kiss the Sky, but with this guy. This guy was very important to the music world. Yeah. He really was. Well, he was, he and was. Plus, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, please. No, finish. I was just going to say he was, uh, 
just like Bob Marley, this is very important, Chris. He was trying to bring races together. You notice how I say that slow, because it usually fleets by people. But yep. He was the original Rainbow Coalition guy. Yeah, man. He wanted all races to come together. He tried to do that with his music. When you speak to his sidemen, which I've, I've toured with his sidemen, I've, I've you know spoke to them, done yeah. the research on this guy. That bothered him when he used to open the curtain and see mostly whites in the audience. He said, how can I, you know, so his music involved, you know, just before he died to incorporate more like Latin, black, yeah. Asians, you know what I mean? Um, so that was very important to him. And that's why he was, that's why he was dangerous to the powers that be. Oh, you sure. start doing that, you know, you're dangerous. Oh, oh, most definitely. That is, I mean, just the the message of unification that he had beyond the stage was was phenomenal. And the the force that he had within the counterculture movement at that time was a, a, more than a magnetic pull, let's say. Um <laughs> <laughs> he was he was definitely one of the icons of that movement and yeah it, 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 yeah, it was it, everything about it, there wasn't a single thing i think about Jimi hendrix that was not apple cart upsetting um from the way that he played guitar um to the the sound that he had to the fact that he was kind of reclaiming rock music's roots yeah, good point. By by bringing rock and roll back to almost the root of straight blues, and and just ex bringing it to a whole new level at the same time. Um, now I want to move the focus real quick from you, your your musical prowess, and the uh, the expertise that it takes to even come close to playing like Jimi Hendrix, much like uh, much less embodying him when you play. Uh, I would like to get into a little bit of the lecture series that you have that goes with this, because I, I, I was reading about that and everything else. I, I did not realize that it was a complete like performance series amongst all of it. Like you said, like a, a stage drama in addition to music. But there's also this lecture part. And like you were saying, like we were just on the topic of he was such a pivot. In music, and uh, he turned the whole industry on its head again. Um, mm -hmm. like the counterculture music had already done that, but when Jimi Hendrix came out, it even turned that on its head. Um, yes. and what, what has the lecture circuit been like for you? What has it been like for you to really deep dive into that research and to prepare being able to explain this not only to people of your generation who may be fans that you know, don't don't necessarily have the voluminous history of rock and roll and Jimi Hendrix that you do, um, as well as upcoming generations. Well, I make it a point in my le PowerPoint lecture, I call it lecture demonstrations, to include facts that are not in the bios or the documentaries on Jimi Hendrix. Hmm. Uh, um, to one example, when Jimi was charting on Billboard, with the first three albums, uh, you hear, matter of fact, before I even mention that, you hear a lot that Jimmy did not reach black people uh, with his music and things like that. Well, when he was charting on Billboard with the first three albums, simultaneously, he was charting extremely high on Billboard's soul R&B charts with those same albums. You know, and later on, Band of Gypsies and then the albums that that are preceded. So black people were very aware of uh, Jimi Hendrix and his music. Mm. Um, Don, uh, he's the guy from Soul Train, um, just the name. Uh, Don Cornelius. Don Cornelius from Soul Train and New York DJ Frankie Crocker were working uh, ceaselessly to get Jimi Hendrix played on black radio. Mm. Uh, they were really, like, really behind this guy. Actually, uh, Frankie Crocker got behind my Hendrix show uh, in the 80s. 
So this is how I know this. And yeah, they, those two guys were working, trying to get his music uh, more to black people. So that's just one example. I mean, I can go on. Plus, um, the, the documentaries do not mention, they'll give a little talking head to uh, uh, one woman who's really responsible for the Jimi Hendrix we know about, and which is why we're talking about him today. And that's Linda Keith. Yep. who was uh, the girlfriend of uh, Keith Richards as well. But she's the one who actually groomed Jimmy to get him presentable to the people she was bringing down to the gigs to see him for backing. She groomed him. I mean, Jimmy, if it was up to Jimmy, he'd get up there dressed almost any way he wanted and hardly sing because he didn't think he was a good singer. He'd sing now and then, but just to play. And she was like, no, 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 no. Here, put this shirt on. <laughs> you know what I mean? Here, put your hair like this. She, she actually curl his hair and, and all that and, and get him to sing more and got him presentable so that when a Chaz Chandler eventually came down out of the other people she brought down, they were actually able to see the package in its infant form. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? She's responsible for that. And she's not given enough credit for that. Um, so... The little things like that is what I bring out. I mean, I go from his early years as a sideman, you know, all the way up. I talk about his his um, his spiritual potential, political affiliations, and uh, you had mentioned to audiences today. I get a lot of young uh, young heads at at my lectures, and I'll make it a point to tell them that now you know Jimi Hendrix is on the first hip hop record. And you should see the 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 oohs and the ahs and the look that I get when I say that. But he is. He's documented as being on the first quote unquote hip hop record. It's a song called Doriella Dufontaine, produced by Alan Douglas, who was working mm. with Jimmy at that time. And uh Buddy Miles and Jimi Hendrix are on that, uh, playing the music. And one of the last poets, which is a spoken word group, one of the last poets is actually rapping the way rappers do today on that record. So that can be considered the first actual hip hop record. So just those things I just mentioned to you, Chris, go look, Google that and go look on um, documentaries and bios. You're not going to see that information. That's just to give you a taste. Yeah. And uh, now before we let you go, um, I want to talk a little bit about new divinity. Uh, what was it that brought you? Because, of course, you've you've had a career and a lifetime spent performing, uh, recording, uh, recording with other people as well and and performing with other people like your your bio and the the people that you have played with are numerous and amazing. Uh, what brought you to start your own production company? Uh, well, yeah, you know, we were talking about that earlier. Everybody in the mother's producer. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for musicians, it's, it's a natural, you know what I mean? Yeah. Matter of fact, that's another thing Jimmy pioneered was um, the musician having his own recording studio. Yes. Uh, he pioneered that idea. Yep. Uh, so it was it was natural. Uh, I'm into the same teachings that Jimi Hendrix was involved in before he died. So that's where New Divinity comes from. Uh, and the electric lady land concept that he embodied, which is dealing with female energy, you won't hear that in any other bio mm-hmm. the documentary. They'll just say, oh, that's the name of an album. That was a concept for him of, of uh, his muse, that female energy. I use that today with working with all female backup musicians. That's Jimmy's, that's Jimmy's concept. That's where he was going with his music. Yeah. So that's where New Divinity comes from, that whole concept of that. Yeah, absolutely. It really is about uh, changing the space around you. I think uh, Mm -hmm. Jimmy kind of had that concept with Electric Ladyland and his studio and that kind of stuff. Like the whole reason, uh, whenever I've helped consult people with home studios, I was like, "You you have to make your home studio somewhere that not only is fun for you, but that welcomes you, that comforts you. Like it, you have to think of it in that old school concept of, uh, like the hearth, 
you know, like in ancient Greece where where you had the hearth in the middle of the home and that's where that's where you invited the muse to come. But you but you had to make it a good place for the muse to want to be. You know, oh. um, and wow, it, you get deep, Chris. <laughs> I, I, I try, buddy. Like I said, I, I started in ministry and ended up mashing buttons for a living. Um, <laughs> wow! <laughs> but but literally, it is that um, like you have to make it somewhere that you don't want to leave. You have to make it somewhere that uh-huh. you look forward to going to. You and you have to make it somewhere that workflow wise is as easy as possible, you know, so that like it doesn't take you 30 minutes of setting up before you hit record. Like you can literally lose that inspirational moment just yes. setting up. And and that was, I think, one of the things that he was really, really keen on was that, hey, man, whenever we're rehearsing, we're hitting record. Yeah, because uh, you never know what's going to come he, out. He made the mistake of uh, thinking he was a producer after he left Chaz. Oh yeah, and uh, so he wasn't. He was a great musician. Uh, what he did, uh, but when he left Chaz, that was it because that was the team. And matter of fact, he realized that before he died and begged Chaz to come back. Uh, to him and after a few times of Chad saying no no I'm busy blah 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 finally Chad said okay send me the masters let's see what we're going then Jimmy died yeah so at least he was smart enough to realize that okay I need this guy because uh, that's another reason why we're speaking about Hendrix is because of Chad Chandler yeah the producer Chad yeah. was able to take all of that rawness of Jimmy uh, all of the noodling that he did, even when he was doing the first hour, all of that stuff, and put it into three-minute gems. Because yeah. he was a producer, uh, you know what I mean? He was with the animals, so he was familiar with that. And that's why we love Jimmy Hendrix from the first three albums, man. Those songs are, are incredible. Yeah. And they're progressive songs, if you really think about yep. it. It's just that they're put into three-minute pop gems, you know yeah. what I mean? yeah. And, and uh, you know, what's so interesting, you bring that up, is so often, so frequently, the producer is forgotten. Yes. Um, like one of my dream interviews in the world to this day, even with this show, it doesn't matter. Like I host three different shows. Uh, Alan Parsons. That, <laughs> yeah. that man's brain for engineering and and, and production is just such a faceted gem it's so amazing the body of work that he's produced and we so often forget the fact that it is the work of the producer to hone and craft like that that's one of the reasons why dark side of the moon sounds the way it sounds is alan parsons recorded and engineered that he produced that Mm. now see i didn't know that wow yeah yeah, so if you go back in like a few early Floyd albums, he did he did a lot of engineering on. He did quite a bit of engineering over at uh, Abbey Road Studios, Alan Parsons. Mm-hmm. So there was a lot of stuff from back in the day that came out of there that had his fingers on it. And th- those producers' fingers um, are like a fingerprint. Like, you can hear that. Much like being able to recognize, like, the guitar tone of Alex Lifeson from rush you know like it there are things like that that are just distinct um and a prime example would even be rush whenever terry brown left them the sound totally changed the way the mix sounded on the cds everything totally changed um some people loved it some people didn't and it was like you said much the same way with jimmy whenever whenever he left um some people loved it. Some people didn't. And he realized that he needed that independent ear. He needed like he could create all day, but that was not his realm. Yeah. And uh, Lee, Lee Malone in the studio became mm. a party. So, um, you know, yeah, uh, I used to have a radio show, an FM radio show, uh, WFDU out of Teaneck, New Jersey. I had that for 12 years. And I was blessed to interview many 
celebrities, uh, a lot of people I admired, uh, but in particular, many people associated with Hendrix. Uh, and, you know, like you said earlier, that they would, you know, say, okay, send me 10 questions or whatever, and well, I'll, I'll see yeah. what I can do, or their manager would say that. And then once they get a load of what I do, they'd be like, dude, I should be interviewing you. Sure. Take all the time you need. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So I've interviewed uh, everybody associated who matters uh, with uh, Jimi Hendrix, as well as people with Sly, James Brown. I mean, I can go on and on, just uh, the people. And when you mention Hendrix, there's always, uh, you know, that, that, that was always in their heart. You know what I mean? They respect them. Yeah, absolutely. And, and and I think that's really what it com comes down to. Even in this interview with you, Jimmy, is respect. Um, you you got to be willing to put it where it belongs. And it, like myself as an engineer, as someone who's sat behind the console on the other side of the speakers for half my life, like I said earlier, hats off to you, man. You got it on all three sides of the triangle. You got it on, on oh, presentation, style, and performance. Like, it's there on all sides. Uh, and it's really fantastic to see someone like you putting forth that effort to not only carry on a musical tradition and a musical styling to a new generation, but to go around and lecture to a new generation, to an older generation, and let them know um, perhaps like we were saying earlier, uh, the way things really were, you know, um, as well as telling a younger generation what could be possible if if you take what he did to the next level. Yeah. Thank you so much, Chris. Appreciate hey, absolutely. One more time before we let you go, Jimmy. Uh, it is time for shameless, shameless self-promotion. Uh, let everybody know where they can go to find out more about New Divinity, your production company, where they can go to hire you if you're, they're looking for sound and film creation in the New York area, uh, where they can go to find out more about Kiss the Sky and even book you guys to come out and do a recreation, stuff like that. Okay, well, uh, actually, the Hendrix Show, that's kissthesky-tribute.com, kissthesky-tribute.com. All the information is there, reviews, tour dates, everything. Uh, and for New Divinity, that's New Divinity, S as in shine, F as in from, C as in consciousness. So that's newdivinitysfc.com. And all the information is there, even about information about myself. Wow, fantastic. Uh Jimmy, please do hold the line while we close things out. Once again, thank you so much for your time. It was incredible, man, to sit back and talk about one of the most amazing musicians ever to walk this earth, to ever to ever graze, uh, grace a sound wave, um, and to talk to somebody the caliber of you who has spent the time and literally a lifetime knowing the man, researching the man, and emulating him to a T musically. Um, kudos to you. Thank you so much again for your time. Hold the line while we close things out. Uh, while you're online checking out once again everything over at New Divinity SFC as well as KissTheSkyTribute.com make sure to stop on by the Talking Sound Podcast everybody. That is where you can find all the episodes. That's where you can find all the articles. Uh, make sure to stop on by our sponsor, True Hemp Science, as well. Thank you for well. tuning in to this episode of bye the bye. Talking Sound Podcast. For more episodes, industry news, and information, visit us online at TalkingSoundPodcast.com. Subscribe to the Talking Sound Podcast on Amazon Audible, Spotify, Spreaker, SoundCloud, iTunes, or your favorite podcast service. Get the latest Talking Sound videos on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, Reach TV, or your Roku or Amazon Fire device with the APR TV app. Talking Sound is a proud member of the HC Universal Network family of podcasts. For more great shows and content, subscribe to hcuniversalnetwork.com today.
Until next time, watch those meters, gig safely, and keep reaching for 11. This is Talking Sound.